The following interview was conducted with Stephen R. Byrne, Charles B. Jordan, um, Professor of Medicinal Chemistry and Head of the Department of Industrial and Physical Pharmacy for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Thursday, January 22, 2009 in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Tell us a little bit about where you were born and parents in early years. Uh, I was born in New Albany, Indiana. My parents were both teachers. I grew up in New Albany. And um, my father ended up uh, being a guidance counselor and in the administration, then assistant superintendent. My mother was an English teacher. I graduated from New Albany High School in 1962. And through all those years, I've always been a huge sports fan. And even at that time, we were Purdue fans. My family was Purdue fans because some of my aunts had come to Purdue. Uh, we were in a area where there were mostly IU and Kentucky fans because we grew up in New Albany, which is near Louisville, Kentucky. So we had to contend with all those different fans. Um, when I was a senior, I had actually applied to Purdue and I was ready to come to Purdue as an engineer, but my father uh, suggests I go to DePaul University and see what it was like there. My mother had graduated from DePaul. And when I went there, I fell in love with that program and I actually was going to do what a 3-2 program, three years at DePaul and then two years at Purdue. But when I went to DePaul, then I became uh, interested in chemistry and graduated from DePaul in chemistry. Tell, I us then, about, tell us about college, what it was like yes. before you came here. And so DePaul was a small school. Uh, while I was at DePaul, I was a chemistry and math major. We had, there was a group of about nine of us that were chemistry majors that a lot of times we taught ourselves uh, as much as the profs taught us. And uh, this reminds me of a story Good. at Harvard they got all of these wonderful grad students in physics from this very small college in New Hampshire. And they couldn't figure out why all these students were so good. So they decided to go up to that college. And when they went there, they found out that the profs taught almost nothing. They just put the groups of students on projects and they taught themselves. And so they were all self-starters. And, and this was kind of the way the group that I was with at DePaul, two of uh, the, People at DePaul went to Harvard. I went to Illinois for grad school, and another one went to uh, Wisconsin. And so um, I graduated from DePaul. Another thing, while I was at DePaul, I used to come up here for football games. And uh, my father was still with the school system, and so I would come up here and watch football games. I think I saw the first football game that the Golden Girl performed in in 1962. I'm not sure it was the first, but certainly one of the early games. Uh, so we came up here, we would hitchhike up here. None of us had cars in, very few students had cars in those days. So we would, my, usually myself and a buddy would hitchhike up here for a game and then hitchhike back. You did pretty well. <laughs> yeah, we had a lot of stories of some of the rides we got too, which I'm not going to go into. <laughs> Save that for another time. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay. Then, then you came to Purdue. Tell us what. Well, the first I went to Illinois, then for a PhD. Oh, but you got your you did you graduated from DePaul and then I, went to. Okay. Yeah, I, and I got my PhD in chemistry at Illinois. Illinois is a very strong program, and I studied. I was wor worked for a National Academy member, who was an organic chemist, but I also had a physical chemist as my major professor, and I studied uh, X-ray crystallography which is a method of determining structures of molecules, and uh, polymorphism, which is like diamonds and graphite. Diamond and graphite are both forms of carbon, but they're different structures. Of course, they have very different properties. Graphite's pencil lead and diamond's a gemstone. So I studied polymorphism of organic compounds. I then got an NIH graduate fellowship, uh, postdoctoral fellowship, to go to UCLA. I had actually had an NSF graduate fellowship while I was at uh, Illinois. And then I went to UCLA and did my postdoc. I met uh, my wife, my bride, 
at DePaul my senior year. She and I courted and then got married while I was at Illinois. So she and I went out to UCLA and we had our first child out there. And I was out at UCLA and it was not that different from now. It was the first big uh, crisis uh, ac that I knew, the big, and there were jobs, there were a lot of job restrictions and there were lots of problems getting jobs. And so I had applied for a job in the school pharmacy at Purdue. They wanted an x-ray crystallographer to do structures of drugs. And I, would, I had always been interested in drugs. So I came out here and ended up getting a job in the school pharmacy. And there's an interesting story connected to that, which was that while I was at UCLA, and the work that I did involved using computers. And in that time frame, in the 70s, early 70s, you couldn't really get on the computer during the day. A number of students were using the computers for their classes. And the computers at that time were about as powerful, the whole campus computer was about as powerful as a laptop is. So everybody was trying to run everything on a laptop, if you can imagine that. And uh, so a lot of us worked at night. So I would work late into the night. I would go work at UCLA during the day, go home about five o'clock, have dinner, get our only child to bed, help my wife get, and then I'd come back to UCLA and work for four or five hours. So when they invited me for an interview out here, I was used to going to bed about two or three in the morning, California time. When I first came for the first day of interview, I was so excited, plus I wasn't used to going to bed until two or three, so I didn't go to sleep at all the whole night. <laughs> so I did my first day of interview without any sleep, and they said, my, you seem so quiet when you were here. <laughs> That's pretty good. Oh, so then you came. So your, I came here and okay. joined the medicinal chemistry department. Okay. Uh, there was a head, the head of the department was Heinz Floss. Heinz was a German biochemist, organic chemist, who turned out, became very famous. And he had been brought in by Vero Tyler. Vero Tip Tyler was a wonderful guy, and he was an outstanding uh, pharmacognosist. I don't know where you've had any discussions of this or not. Make a comment on it. For the researchers, you might want to share this. Yeah, and pharmacognosy is drugs from plants. So Tyler wanted to bring a, a drugs from plants orientation to Purdue. And there had been some of that previously in the Dean Jenkins era, but Tyler wanted to strengthen that. So he brought in this biochemist named Floss. And Floss then brought in an organic chemist named John Cassidy. And then they started hiring faculty. And I was one of the first faculty and they hired me to do structures of organic compounds. And during my first years being a chemist, I continued to have a linkage to chemistry and the chemistry department invited me to their faculty lunch. They used to have a lunch where each of the faculty, where all the faculty came in and each faculty presented a seminar. And of course, Herb Brown was there, the famous Nobel laureate, as well as many other of the famous chemists, Harry Morrison and uh, Bob Benkesser. They were all there, Nathan Kornblum. I don't know how many of these you've been able to interview, wow. but they were all there at this lunch. And of course, I was there as a young assistant professor, and I can remember one time I was presenting some of my ideas on solid state chemistry and polymorphism, and uh, Herb Brown said, Steve, if you keep answering questions, you're never gonna get through your seminar. You're just gonna have to go ahead and go through your slides. And he was a great mentor to everybody. Brown was a, a wonderful guy and a great mentor, so, uh, I always remember that as the first few years. Right. And then uh, tell us, go on from, then uh, continued on, and, uh, and you were the counselor for pharmacy students and your graduate students in teaching and your research. Continue with that. Okay, and this, uh, so. You became department head. Exactly. Right. So um, uh, I continued to develop my program when we came, when I came here. And at the time, just at the time I came, uh, we formed a group that met at night. We worked day and night 
In fact, I told my wife when I came here, I said, I'm only going to get one chance to get promoted, so I'm going to work day and night. I even would work some on Christmas uh, doing x-ray crystallography, and this was the old days when we worked a lot. And uh, so we had meetings at night of this group that was wanted to form the cancer center. It was led by Heinz Floss again. And then at that time, Heinz pulled in another faculty member named Jim Murray. And Heinz and Jim, John Casty, Olford Horneman, another person that Heinz had brought in myself, uh, and some other people, and I can't remember all of them, some vet school groups, uh, we met and we eventually formed the Cancer Center and put in a grant and we, I think we were the first or the second university to get a cancer center without a med school. And we were a drug development cancer center. And uh, that continued then today. We still have a cancer center. Sure. What year about was that? Director? That was in the 70s, 72, okay. I think were the first meetings. Uh, we could look. I. I would think that cancer grant got funded in 76, I'm okay. thinking, but we'd, we'd have to check those numbers. Is it, is it true today that, w that that center is one of the few that's affiliated with an academic but not with a medical school? That's school? correct. It still continues that way. Right. And um, so uh, we can, I continued to work with that group, and I started to get NIH grants. And, uh, of course, in those days it was easier than it is now, but I started to get NIH grants, which would pay part of my salary, and then we would use that salary to hire more faculty. So we built up our department on soft money, if you want to use that term. And um, we continued to do cancer research. Floss then ultimately left for Ohio State, and Cassidy got made department yet. And then when uh, Tyler stepped down, they Casty applied for the job o along with a young scientist from Kansas named Charles Rutledge. And Purdue's tradition in pharmacy had especially been to bring an outside dean in. So Purdue brought in Rutledge, and Cassidy then left and went to Ohio State as dean. And so then I ended up becoming department head. So that's sort of how it... The uh, sequencing. That's the sequencing of how it works. Okay. So, and all through that time, we continued very heavily on cancer research. And we hired a number of really good faculty, including Marietta Harrison, Carol Post, Bob Galen, Marietta's uh, husband, uh, during that time frame. Mark Cushman, Mark Loudon, uh, Dave Nichols, we hired a number of, of faculty that are still here today doing sure, excellent right. work. What were some of the other changes that were initiatives and responsibilities as the department head, the department students, and talk a little about the students too. Sure. Yeah. Now, all through that time, and I don't want to uh, ignore this, we, we all of us had significant numbers of students. I would have a group of from five to ten with a couple postdocs. My first grad student, uh, I was uh, a professor in analytical chemistry because x-ray crystallography is a type of way of analyzing chemicals. So I taught a lot of analytical chemistry and drug analysis through my years. And I want to mention Del Canaval. Del Canaval was um, a, a real mentor to me in the education program because I came in as a chemist and didn't really have the pharmacy background. Dell was a pharmacy background, and so he met with me, I remember my first year, and he's passed away now, but he was a wonderful mentor to me and helped me a lot with my education. Well, my first grad student is, was Vice President Cardinal in, in quality and, met, and uh, regulatory. About my fifth or sixth grad student is Vice President Pfizer in regulatory. So a number of our students went on to be very successful. Uh, two other students, I remember a story about Bill Randolph, who is a vice president at J&J. Bill was in our undergrad analysis course, and he was married, and he already had a child. And he came to me and said, what am I going to do? We, you know, I need money. I have a child, a family, and I'm trying to get along. I said, well, maybe what you could do is go out and work in the evening at Lilly and Tippy Labs and do analytical chemistry and continue with your pharmacy program. And so he would go to school 
until four, and then he'd go out on Lily and work a full shift doing analytical chemistry until midnight, and then come back, and he's now Vice President Johnson and Johnson. You got him motivated exactly. early on. <laughs> so those were some of the students now, and this continued until about 1988, in that time frame. At that time, there was an outstanding NMR spectroscopist in chemistry named Dave Gornstein. I don't know whether that name's come up or not. Dave now is at University of Texas, Galveston, is a distinguished professor. He was a, extremely good with NMR spectroscopy, which is a method of analyzing chemicals. Again, he was in the chemistry department. And at that time, people began to become concerned about this disease that they didn't know what, what it was and where it came from, and that was AIDS, HIV. And so the NIH put out a request for centers to study HIV. So Dave came over to me and said, Steve, why don't you, because I was department at MedCam, why don't you be PI and we'll put in a grant to form an AIDS center. And it was patterned after the cancer center. So it was an AIDS center that would discover drugs to treat AIDS. And uh, so we uh, involved uh, another aspect of my early career. While I was here doing the cancer work, I also went to Michael Rossman's seminars because he was a crystallographer. And my major professor and Rossman were grad students together one of my major professors are banned. So I went to his seminars and the organic lunches. So I knew Rossman, so he came in into the AIDS Center. So we had an AIDS Center, we had the chemistry department, the biology, and the med camp. And then we pulled in the vet school too. So the four of us went and we got one of the first 13 AIDS Centers. And that was my first real contact with publicity. I mean, we were on the front page of the paper, we were, live from this studio. We were down in Indianapolis live and we were talking. And during those periods of time, there was tremendous fear of the virus, that it could get out and contaminate. And I remember President Beering at the time made a statement to the press, there'll never be AIDS virus on this campus. And uh, so, <laughs> And uh, so we, this really didn't affect us because we were doing drug development. We could test at any site our drugs. So uh, we continued with the AIDS Center for about 10 years, eight years, when the NIH finally discontinued the drug part of the program because that was really being handled by the pharmaceutical industry. At that, The pharmaceutical industry then came in with both feet, really, and took over the aid drug development. And so NIH then went to vaccines. We weren't as strong in vaccines. So we didn't continue with the AIDS work. But that was uh, the next phase. So the first phase was cancer, and the next phase was AIDS. Of course, we kept cancer going, and that continues today. All right. Are you still involved with that? Uh, I'm not heavily involved with cancer, but I may be getting back into the area. And so maybe I'll go on with the story then of what happened to me in academically. Okay. All right. Well, maybe you want to ask me some well, questions. Go ahead. Go with that, what you were going to say. So um, around perfect. that same period of time, it became clear that this solid state chemistry and this polymorphism was what I'll call the linchpin to drug development. Uh, previously, people didn't realize this. But when you make a new drug, you normally want to make a tablet or a capsule of it. And it's quite clear now in retrospect, if you make a tablet that has diamonds in it and another one has graphite, those are going to act quite differently. And so it turned out that retrospectively, knowing what solid state form you have is what I call the linchpin to drug development. If you have the right form, you can make a very good drug. If you have the wrong form, it may never dissolve in the body. So I realized that uh, this solid state chemistry area was going to take off. And so um, also at that time, my wife and I, by that time, we had, had, we had adopted some children. So we had a family of eight. We had four biological children and four adopted children. And um, we were also, my wife and I were realizing 
that although if I had a great salary from Purdue, we couldn't put all these kids through school <laughs> and grow up. As you may know, it costs more when kids are older than younger. <laughs> We did a slight We're miscalculation <laughs> in our system. So we were praying and trying to figure out what are we going to do. And so I said to my wife, you know, we could maybe we could start a company to look at this polymorphism for these companies, a service company. And uh, so at that time, I asked to step down from department ed and start this company, SSCI. Well, SSCI stands for Solid State Chemical Information. Now, that company grew to 100 people, and it still exists today. But I'll go on with the academic part of this story. Mm -hmm. So I had stepped down to try to form this company, where about that time, another department in the School of Pharmacy, Industrial and Physical Pharmacy, didn't have a head. And so Rutledge, knowing that I had stepped down from MedChem, said, well, why don't you go over and be the head of this department for a while? And so I switched departments <laughs> and continued to do my research and teaching in this new department of industrial pharmacy. And um, so that happened about 90. Ar around 96, the, uh, uh, a, two young engineers from the East Coast showed up here at campus and they said, we're working with MIT and we're uh, developing uh, advanced manufacturing for pharmacy. And MIT is great for theory, but they don't have any manufacturing. They never have seen it. They don't have a tablet press. They don't have a blender. They can't make drugs. And so we need a partner. And you guys, we've checked around, and you're the best. So will you guys be a partner with us? So we uh, linked our program with MIT and formed a consortium called CAMP, Consortium for the Advancement of Manufacturing and Pharmacy, called CAMP. And that consortium uh, brought probably $8 million to Purdue over the next 10 years, 5 to $8 million in the manufacturing area. And so we were able to advance pharmaceutical manufacturing during that time frame. That was about, so this was 88 when we did the AIDS Center. Then I stepped down from department head and men came about 95. 96 was when these guys came. And then we continued into about 2006 with camp. So during my headship of industrial pharmacy, I've been uh, heavily involved with manufacturing and this concept of polymorphism was a key element. Right. You talked about uh, your company. Tell us a little bit of how that got started, because that was one of the things I was going to ask you a little bit about. Yeah. So, so as I said, around 91, in that time frame, 91 to 94, uh, my wife and I formed a company called the SSCI. Mm -hmm. And this company was aimed at doing contract work for industry. And one of the reasons we started it is companies were asking me to do lab work for them. And in fact, they were asking me to do so much that I realized, again, I constantly had about five or six grad students, that the students weren't doing their thesis. They were working for these companies doing these projects. And they, they were confidential, so they couldn't even put them in their thesis. So I realized these students are never going to get done if we continue to do these projects. So. Uh, we moved the projects out to the private company where it's, it, they fit better because they were contract research, really. And then we moved our students on to research. Well, as things happened, just more and more people came to us, and we hired, we had a few years where we hired 20 people a year, around the years 1997, 1999. We hired about 20 people a year and, and grew from a very small group to about 100 people. We still continue uh, operation. Our company was bought by a larger firm named Aptuit in 2006. We, my wife and I still continue to work extensively with uh, Aptuit. Mm -hmm. And that company, the big advantage of the being bought was that the company that bought us has manufacturing and animal testing, clinical trial animal testing. 
And in order to get a drug on the market, you have to have animal testing, you have to do this polymorphism, this solid state work, and then you have to make the drug. And so this firm has all those things in, within, its, its, uh, within the firm itself. So it can provide a full service. And in fact, we're offering now a service that we call FAST to IND. It's a service where a firm gives us a chemical and then we develop the supplies to do the first step in marketing, which is called an IND or an investigational new drug trial. Mm -hmm. So our firm is really focused on doing the chemistry part to facilitate an early drug trial. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, talk, uh, one of the, another area that you've sort of been a little bit involved in was with the Center for Paralysis Research. You're doing, helping a little bit with that too as well. Exactly. Now so. that, is, there's a, of course there's stories with each one of these. I assume you're finding this. Of course. So this is a fun story also. That project started with uh, Dr. Borgens. Have you I'm not, I'm not interviewed him yet, but I hope to. Yes, Dr. Borgens is extremely interesting. So Dr. Borgens came over and he said, Steve, we, I developed this drug called 4 And I, got, I have the first patent and Purdue uh, sold the patent to a company named Accorda. And Accorda won't give me any of the drug. And they won't uh, uh, give me any for my animal trials. And this is not that atypical because a firm that's developing a drug, and that drug will ultimately now come on the market. This, this original drug that was discovered by Borgens here at Purdue, by uh, Richard Borgens, called 4 So this drug, and he could tell you the whole story, but he discovered the drug here. The drug increases nerve transmission past injured spinal column. So, and the way he discovered this was uh, uh, testing first just spinal columns and then dogs that had been hit by cars. So people would bring the dog in, they'd, be, they'd have no motion in their rear legs, they'd give them this drug, they'd get motion. So, and what it does is it, any nerve pulse that's going, it enhances it. It improves nerve transmission. So um, that drug progressed through this system. As I said, they wouldn't give him any when they had tablets. They tested those tablets in spinal cord injury and the trial failed. We think it's because they chose the wrong patients. But then they tested it in multiple sclerosis and it passed with flying colors. So the drug is actually gonna come on the market as, as a multiple sclerosis drug. Well, Richard said, they won't, they won't let us use any of the drug. They won't tell us how they're manufacturing, and we want to be able to do some dog tests. He said, can you manufacture some tablets for us? So we went in the literature and found a paper that explained how to do the manufacturing that was already published. The advantage of that is that avoids patents. If somebody published a paper, a scientist can repeat that and not be accused of infringing a patent. So we repeated that paper and we gave Richard some tablets and we actually repeated that and made little bitty tablets for guinea pigs. We actually <laughs> made guinea pig sized tablets as well as dog sized tablets. And so Richard was able to test that. Well, one of my colleagues who was, who was a postdoc with me named Dan Smith came to me one day and Dan said, you know what, we, we ought to make some derivatives of this formino period because we can, I think we, I know how to improve the compound. So we brainstormed all this. He went into the lab, made some derivatives, and we now have a derivative that in animal tests is 100 times more active than this drug that's coming on the market. So we're right in the middle now of developing this new drug. It's a very exciting activity yeah, yeah, yeah. to think about developing a new drug. Of course, we've been in drug development for many years, but it's a continued involvement. Right, in and really nice, that's right. Uh, engagement, you were talking about uh, the Chow Center would be another thing, if you make a yeah. comment on that, how that came about. Yes, the Chow Center was uh, a program that we, another story and another program that we had a lot of fun with. Um, it turns out that Alan Chow was a uh, graduate of Purdue along with his 
son, his brother-in-law, David Shaw, and David's wife was Alan's sister. And Alan and David and his wife, and Alan's wife, came to West Virginia, to the United States, came to West Virginia from Taiwan as, uh, I think it's correct that they came from Taiwan, uh, it could have been China, but at any rate, they came to West Virginia and got a master's degree. And then they wanted to come to the strongest manufacturing program. So they left West Virginia with a master's and came here and got their PhD, both Alan and David. And Alan used to, during the time while he was here, the basement of the pharmacy building was uh, used, the hallway was used as a hockey rink, a dry hockey set. <laughs> they had a little puck and they used to play hockey and Alan talks about all this. Again, the grad students during that time frame, which was the late 70s, were day and night. Right. Well, Alan and David went to work for Cyril Pharmaceuticals in Chicago. And that, they learned a lot about how to make birth control pills there. And then Alan and David, Alan's, both of them are big entrepreneurs. So they finally decide to leave Cyril and form a generic company, generic pharmaceutical company at, in the early 80s when the Generic Drug Act to make hard to make materials, which included birth control pills. And so they began to make generic birth control pills in a facility in Chicago. Well, at that time, they realized that this could take off. So they needed capital. And uh, for one reason or another, uh, they couldn't generate enough capital in Chicago. Plus, Alan's brother, another brother, was a banker in California, Los Angeles area. And so they moved to Los Angeles, start, they mortgaged everything, and they started this pharmaceutical, Chow, uh, pardon me, Watson Pharmaceutical. And Watson was named uh, after Alan's mother. Her name was Wa, H-U-A. So Watson is an Americanization of the son of Wa. Mm -hmm. So that's Watson Pharmaceutical. So Alan developed Watson. It, it became, it still exists, but it became under his leadership, I think the third largest generic. And most of the stock was owned by his family. So he's, he might be a billionaire, certainly very, very wealthy. So um, when Purdue went to the Rose Bowl, uh, Dr. Jiski met with Alan and talked to him about doing some things, and Alan seemed interested. So then Dean Rutledge and myself went out and started talking to Alan about different ways he could help the school. And we centered on a fact that Alan said when he hires a new student from Purdue or anywhere, they don't know regulatory. They don't know the FDA procedures for getting drugs on the market. And he wanted to increase that. So he funded the building of the Chow Center, which is an FDA approved manufacturing facility that's located in the research park in order to create a uh, educational system that would educate our students on regulatory. And so that's how that program came Got about. That, right. One other thing that you were involved into was that regulatory, that teaching the certificate and the degree program, yeah. that sort of leads in or follows on that child. Exactly. Uh, right after we started the child program, mm -hmm. another one of our alumni uh, named uh, Todd Shermack, who's now vice president at Abbott, Todd, uh, Abbott had had some regulatory problems. And so, this is in retrospect, they decided, Abbott's a big pharmaceutical company in Chicago. They probably employ 20,000 people. So they uh, decided that they needed to have some outside education, outside regulatory education. So um, Todd calls me and he says, we're gonna, we need a master's in regulatory. And there's one at Temple that we've been looking at, but it's very far away. And he said, I wonder if you want to start a master's program and we'll get Lily involved too and we'll, get, we'll help you get it started, we'll do lecturing for you and you can build up this program. And so indeed, and again, being a big entrepreneur, I couldn't say no to that. And so we said yes, we started the program. Lily and Abbott each gave us about 
I don't know, 20, 30 to 50,000. So not huge amounts, but nice Good amounts start. of startup. And then they paid tuition for all their students to come here. To come here, and we set it up like an executive master's program, it's kind of patterned after the Craner program. And we've had about 120 certificate program, which are three graduate courses, and about 30 masters people come through the program. And it's um, been very successful. We're now located, we now actually teach the program, uh, the first part of it, in Chicago because we can get more enrollees in Chicago. And then we teach the advanced part here at Purdue. So it's it's been a very successful program for our department. Yeah. And it's still going. I'm it's going. still going and we have uh, about 50 people in different levels this next semester. You're still this, involved with the program? I'm still the director. In fact, I'm. that's one of the things I'm probably going to step down as department head and spend more time on that program. Okay. So, what, talking about department head, one thing I was going to ask about that when it became the um, your professor, the Charles P. Jordan. Yes, that occurred in while well, I was in medicinal chemistry right after the AIDS Center. The um, I became the Charles B. Jordan professor shortly after we were able to get the the heavy funding in the AIDS area. Uh, Jordan was a former dean of the School of Pharmacy, so I, that was a very nice honor. Dean Rutledge uh, was in charge of that, and it was a wonderful honor. I really appreciate yeah, it. Very nice. Very nice. Uh, I have a little joke about that, though. I tell a lot of jokes, but parking in pharmacy is very difficult, and I'm not normally a person that's big on honors. So one time I told Dean Rutledge, I don't care anything about the professorship or what you call it, but boy, that parking place. I really love that parking place. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds all right. And I, I've got some, uh, let's move on, uh, faculty fellow. You've uh, done that. Well, that change has changed a lot over the years. Yes, it has. We, my wife and I, during the 80s, when we had small children, we were fac fellows at Shreve. And we would go over there every Thursday with our family, with our big family, eight children, and we would eat there with the students. And, and uh, I was director of faculty fellows for a couple years. And we, the children, our eight children, the adopted children that we adopted were African American. So we had a blended family of biological uh, Caucasian students, children, and African American. And that was a very good situation for the students. And, mm -hmm really enjoyed that, and it was good for the good students for the and good for our family. Right. Did any of your, have any of your children gone to Purdue? Yes. Uh, one of our children, uh, one of our African-American children, two of our Afri one's graduate from Purdue and is a master's student at the University of Chicago, and another one of them is, is still in Purdue. Oh, very So good. our students, have, our children have uh, really liked Purdue. Yes. Okay. Um, let's talk a little about some of the awards, and I'd, li I'd like to start with the first one here, the Outstanding Commercialization Award that you just received. Congratulations. Thank you very, very much. Nice. That was a really nice award. That award uh, was for the starting of SFCI, um, and I can explain a little bit more. Um, our, the faculty business that, that I started was really a, was a team effort with my wife and I. And um, the, if you look at businesses and what helps a business run, um, especially in this Six Sigma, the lean, and a successful business, there are considered to be three components, technology or science. We're talking about science, but science, business, and people. And in fact, they di draw this Venn diagram of three circles overlapping. And uh, in our system, my wife and I's system, I did only did the science. She did the business and the people. And what we were able to do, because we had the two of us, we were able to split that and build a very strong program. And what people say now is that the most successful businesses are the ones that achieve the balance between the technology or the science, the business, you have to pay attention to business, obviously, or you'll go bankrupt, and the people. And so um, I got that Outstanding Commercialization Award for the science part. I 
would say that I'm, um, I have tons of ideas, but most of them aren't very good. Okay. <laughs> And so, again, working with my wife, we were able to sort through, and she's really good at sorting through my ideas, so we were able to sort through the ideas and come up with the ones that help most through with SSCI. We, what we did at SSCI, and what I would do is try to come up with sort of the big marketing picture, what, the big selling, the high end, and then we would go out and sell that, and then other people would just come in with smaller projects and they would reason, if you can do these real high-end things and you can do our smaller project too. So that was sort of how we built the business. And, and it grew, grew from there, it grew out from it, there. That, it grew out of that kind of strategy. Right. Good, the, um, you got the FDA Advisory Committee Award, um, but one of the other ones was that, um, the Thomas Bidford Memorial Award um, from the, uh, for the intramural development World of Difference Award from the state. Very and, nice. Yeah, and that was another award for SSCI. Um, again, recognizing my contribution in this effort that my wife and I did. Um, that was a very nice award, again, from the state. And uh, the state, of course, is very excited about faculty businesses. And <clears throat> they like ours because we took a technology from the university and went out and formed a business from it. So it was complementary to the university, if, you, if I can put it that way. And they really right. yeah. like that strategy and they think it can be replicated and so do I. So I, I, you know, as we enter into this new era where we need to start new businesses, I mean, we don't have enough employment, so we've got to start new businesses. In fact, I thought a little bit that every entrepreneur in 2009 should start at least one business. Sounds good. <laughs> one new business because we don't have enough businesses right now in the country. That's right, yeah. You've been um, represented on some government and agencies and you're, are you still got, you're still the, what, the FDA, USP, Purdue's representative on that. that you had a very active involvement with the agencies. And yes, overtime. I've always been, and this really started back with Del Canable. Dell was a member of a board, a state board, called the State Controlled Substance Advisory Committee. And that was a committee, as you all know, many of the painkillers, the best painkillers are ab drugs of abuse. They can be abused, but they're wonderful drugs to relieve pain. So there's a committee on the state that deals with handling those drugs and making sure that people don't get addicted to drugs unnecessarily. I mean, sometimes if people have back injuries or something, they maybe have to be addicted to them in order to relieve the pain and have any quality of life until the injury goes away. Sure, right. But at any rate, um, so Dell was a main member of that committee, and then when he mentored me, and then I became a main member, and I actually was a chair, and then that led to the FDA Advisory Committee uh, the FDA Advisory Committee, uh, the FDA has an advisory committee structure that really is troubleshooting, a troubleshooting system. So they were, they're a government agency, of course, they would handle as much as they could internally. But then when it came to any kind of troubleshooting or public issues, they would get a committee, normally of professors, and they would haggle over the problem and provide advice. And a lot of times the FDA would do what those uh, committee said. So they appointed myself and other academics on the Pharmaceutical Sciences Advisory Committee and we dealt with manufacturing issues, issues related to bioequivalence which relates to generic drugs and so on and I served on that committee and then the United States Pharmacopeia was kind of a sister committee that worried about the quality of drugs and the potency of drugs. And uh, so I also served on that committee. So I've been very fortunate and thankful to serve on committees where we're really trying to affect the quality of the drugs in America and the potency and the, that they work properly, try to avoid problems like the heparin problem that we've recently had. Right. Uh, you can't totally avoid these, but you try to develop systems that will avoid these problems. So you don't have them. Hopefully exactly. Not, yeah. Let's, um, how about a favorite Purdue tradition? Do you have one of those, an, an sure. outstanding event? 
Yeah, well, our favorite Purdue tradition, it's really uh, many things, is the bowl games. Our, we have our children, our eight children have grown and they have children, and we've had as many as 26 people go to a bowl game. You could have your own plane. Charter. Exactly. We, uh, we uh, couldn't afford that, but we did take, uh, you know, one flight. We have several stories. Uh, one story related to this is the Rose Bowl, okay? And I'm a huge Purdue football fan, as you might guess. And so our favorite tradition is going to bowl games. So when we went to the Rose, maybe I should go back and say, the first bowl games we went to were the Alamo Bowl. That, well, I had actually gone myself to bowl games when Jim Young was a coach in the early 80s. As we had discussed, I had been on the athletic committee during that period of time. Right. Yeah. The Big Ten requires that the athletic department be governed by a committee that has a majority of professors on it. So I ended up getting on the athletic committee, which is a prestigious committee. I, as an associate professor, the way I got on there is I was so mad at Bobby Knight one time for something they did that I wrote a letter to him. And I told all my colleagues that I wrote a letter. So they nominate me for that, like me, they see anybody that <laughs> oh, Bobby Knight a letter. So at any rate, so I was on that, like me. Well, during that time, either myself or my wife and I went to the bowl games. Those were in the 80s when Jim Young was, Jim Young was a coach. And the Carmel Connection. Exactly, Mark Herman and, uh, um, now you're going to, yeah. uh, the yeah. wide receiver, Bart Burrow. Bart and Burrow. Bart is still here in town. In fact, some of my children have been in a high school with his kids and are good friends with him. But Bart's a great guy. But at any rate, that was a very exciting period of time. And uh, so, but at that time, only myself or myself and my wife went. Well, then when Jim Young, Jim, uh, Joe Tiller came, then the first bowl game we went, we had a number of our kids at our house and they were just hanging around. They didn't, you know, we had Christmas and they were just hanging around and they didn't really have, you know, these were teenagers. What are they gonna do in Lafayette for the whole week between Christmas and New Year? So I to, said to my wife, and we had, because we had a big family, we had a big band. So I said, well, we're gonna have to do something with these kids. Why don't we just go down to the bowl game? So actually she didn't go because we still had younger kids, but we loaded in all the teenagers into our big van and drove all night down to Texas to the first bowl game. And then we had so much fun that I said, we all have to go. So the second Alamo, we all went. And we had a wonderful time at San Antonio and we've continued to go to all the bowl games. So that's our, our um, that's family. That's a great tradition. Now, and so I got to tell you about the Rose Bowl tickets now. So when we went to the Rose Bowl, the first, we said, well, we got, we got to get tickets for our family. So the first uh, information that came out of Purdue as kind of rumor was that each school would get two tickets. The dean and his wife would each get a ticket for each of the schools of Purdue, and that would be all the tickets. The rest of them would go to the alumni. So we said, oh no, well, we're not gonna be able to go. So I said, okay, well, I better call all of my pharmacy alumni friends who I'd known. So I called all these friends and the ones that weren't going, I said, go ahead and put in for tickets and then I'll buy them from them. So I ended up with 52 Rose Bowl tickets. And um, this came in handy because the school pharmacy had some alumni that weren't high enough on the point system to get tickets from the university, but they still wanted to honor them. So I became the alumni, <laughs> the distribution center. alumni broker uh, for the sort of like the mid top range of alumni who didn't get tickets. <laughs> At that tier. <laughs> and uh, so I also served as a ticket broker for the Rose Bowl. Oh, that's so. great. <laughs> Oh, but what'd you, you flew out though, did you? We flew out, we actually stayed in San Diego because we had lived in Los Angeles and we actually weren't in, well, just north of San Diego on the La Jolla area. That's a wonderful location, then we just commuted up. Yeah, that's a good idea. And we had a wonderful vacation out there. Yeah.
How about an outstanding event? Anything come to mind that you'd like to share with us? Well, I would say that Alamo Bowl, probably the one we won where Breeze was the quarterback, that's probably, you know, and then these awards I've gotten, but the Alamo Bowl, these awards, my wife got a Distinguished Alum, uh, Friends of Pharmacy Award, that's a highlight also. Is your wife also in pharmacy? Or is she no, she's a nurse, actually. Oh, okay, so she but got a nursing degree. But she's uh, extremely good in this people and business area. Did she ever practice in nursing? She did. Early on, she she taught new mother classes and public health nursing. Mm -hmm. well, that's a good combination. Yeah. Um, now is your turn. Any closing comments or what you'd like to, anything you wish to share? Well, just a... Um, I've had a wonderful experience at Purdue. It's been a great place to work, and um, I think Purdue is a good place for people that are entrepreneurial. It's, you have to understand the Purdue system, but I, it's been a great place for me, and I wouldn't trade it for anything, and I'm very thankful. Okay. I thank you very much, Dr. Okay. And this concludes the uh, interview. Thank you very, very okay. much. Okay.